based on the environment and our circumstances to maintain homeostasis. So, you know, put really simply, you go into a stressful experience and blood glucose, blood pressure, cortisol, adrenaline levels go up, you leave that stressful experience, and if you are resilient, um, those levels will come back down to their pre-event state. Welcome to the High Performance Health Podcast with your host, Angela Foster. The show where we talk about everything you need to break through limits and achieve a high performance mind, body and lifestyle. Welcome to another episode of the High Performance Health Podcast. I'm your host, Angela Foster, and today I'm joined by Alex Manos. Alex is a mentor, lecturer, coach, and functional medicine practitioner with an MSc in personalized nutrition and a BSc in nutritional therapy. He's also started his studies in breathwork, currently completing the Oxygen Advantage Certification um, with a previous podcast guest, Patrick McCohen, and he's also about to start his studies in transformational breath work. He has a keen passion and is interested in psychedelics and uses the concept of resilience to create a truly holistic approach to health and performance. And in this episode, we first start by looking at resilience and then move into the world of psychedelics. It's actually quite a long episode. And so I've taken the decision to break it into two parts. So part one is today, which is all about about physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual resilience and how you can really develop that strong sense of self and purpose that I think we all need in this current environment. And then if you're interested in part two, which I will be releasing on Friday, we dive into the world of psychedelics and take a deeper look into meditation and breath work and also using plant medicine um, if that's something that you're open to. And Alex discusses his experience when he went to synthesis, um, a mushroom retreat in Amsterdam and what happened there. So that, that second part is all going to be in Friday's episode. Um, for today's episode, we're just going to be looking at the world of resilience and how you can really become a more resilient human and handle all of the stresses that are being thrown at us currently. Um, so that you can really put your best self forward and have the most up-to-date coping strategies to succeed and not just succeed, but really thrive in this current environment. So let me introduce you now to Alex. And as I say, enjoy this episode on resilience with a further one as a bonus episode coming on Friday, where we go a little bit deeper and a little bit more into the spiritual world. So Alex, welcome to the show. It's amazing to have you here. When I was doing some, I always like to research my guests and, and I'm not sure how you initially popped up actually on my feed on Instagram. I think we have mutual connections and uh, I was very excited on, uh, on some of your content. And then I was doing some research this morning. I can honestly say that I probably could talk to you all day. There's so many <laughs> topics. Um, but I think for these purposes today, um, I really want to get stuck in with you talking about resilience in all its forms and also the interaction between um, gut health and mental health in particular. And we can touch a bit on psychedelics. I think it's going to be an exciting episode because I know you're well-versed in all these topics. So first of all, a huge welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Oh, thank you for, for having me on. It's nice to be on the other end of the microphone and, and share some thoughts. Yes, I'm sure, because I love listening to your podcast as well. Um, and you are a clinician, a trainer. You do lots of training for coaches as well, as well as being a coach and a mentor yourself. So I'm guessing that you really see this and a podcaster from all angles, really, which is why I think it's going to be such a good episode. So let's start off with you kind of introducing your background and what you do so people can understand a bit more about you. Yeah, so I guess, you know, there's, there's a long and a, a shorter story, ultimately, but to give people the full context, um, from a very, very early age, and we're talking really a few weeks, a couple of months old, I, I really struggled with eczema to the point that I was waking up in the morning with blood over my skin from just itching so much over the night. Um, and that kind of progressed into a more sort of severe state um, I ended up with digestive issues. And as many of your listeners probably know, there's a pretty strong connection between certain skin conditions like eczema and 
uh, imbalances in the microbiome and what we call IBS and things like this as well. Um, and I actually had, being very personal here, an, an accident in the toilet when I was five years old in primary school. Um, and to cut a long story short, looking back, it was probably quite a traumatic experience for me then. Um, and my mum always says that since then, I refused to go to the toilet at school. Um, basically, I went for a pee, ended up having a poo all over myself at that age, because your shorts are down by your ankles oh, going yeah. for a pee. And then walked through school um, with older kids, seeing it, etc. And that led to essentially long-term constipation. That went on throughout my childhood ultimately and it was actually only when I was 18 I was diagnosed by the GP with irritable bowel syndrome and for two or three years before that I was getting played with injuries as well so I was a keen athlete at school in rugby and athletics um, but just kept on injuring myself and again looking back with the knowledge I have now there was surely an intimate connection between what was going on from a gut perspective and sort of musculoskeletal health with some low level inflammation just driving a lot of that um, and it was really those two things so seeing loads of physiotherapists osteopaths massage therapists for the sort of physical stuff um, and also then having a diagnosis of ibs and being told at 18 that you know here's your peppermint oil you're going to have to try and just navigate this for the rest of your life that led me into nutritional therapy eventually. Um, so I was very fortunate that from a young age, I always knew I was going to be a personal trainer. So from about 15 years old, that was my dream. Um, I became a personal trainer immediately out of uh, university and then started my diploma in nutritional therapy. And then fast forwards 14 years, I guess, and now um, I have a master's in personalized nutrition. Um, I've completed the Institute for Functional Medicine certification program. So I'm a, a functional medicine practitioner um, and obviously sort of a personal trainer with various qualifications in that side of things. Um, and I'm also just finalizing my diploma in life coaching and I'm now very much looking at sort of going down the breathwork routes. So I'm looking at becoming a breathwork practitioner over the next couple of years as well. So that's me wow. in a nutshell. That's exciting. So that, I mean, that really is all round holistic health, isn't it? I love the way you integrate all of those um, disciplines together. Um, I think people listening, I do, don't, before we leave kind of, because it's a really interesting story. And before we leave that, a lot of people listening will have skin problems like eczema or psoriasis and will have been told that they have IBS. And that's such an umbrella term, isn't it? It mm. really is kind of meaningless. In your own experience, because obviously that was then causing you injuries and things, so it becomes physical and there must have been underlying inflammation, I'm guessing, throughout the body. Yeah. What, was, um, what did you identify as the cause of it and how were you able to fix that? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's a tricky one to answer in some ways because because of what was available back then. So when I was 17, 18, this is obviously at a time when there wasn't social media really, and there wasn't that kind of access to information that there is now. I can kind of assume that throughout most of my childhood and teenage years, SIBO was present. So small intestine bacterial overgrowth that requires um, a breath test ultimately is kind of the clinical way that we diagnose that. Um, and then there were certainly some bacterial imbalances within the large intestine. I have done stool tests over the years, as you can imagine. And even in my 20s, there were times when a little bit of candida was coming up, uh, which isn't actually as common as a lot of people think. Uh, I get a lot of people coming to me thinking that they have candida as the underlying issue to their IBS type symptoms. But in my experience, it's more often there's a bacterial rather than a fungal issue going on there. Um, and then there's the bigger picture, which is this concept of oral tolerance. So oral tolerance, if um, people aren't familiar with the concept, it's really where the immune system uh, is responding appropriately. So is almost not responding to our food and to our microbiome. And for various reasons, we can lose oral tolerance. And then suddenly we ha we're having an inappropriate immune response to food or our microbiome. And then we're on the topic suddenly of food allergies and food sensitivities and things like this. Um, and I can only assume that really from a very young age, I had lost oral tolerance. And based on the fact that my eczema started when I was so young, um, I also can only assume that my mum was probably eating something that she shouldn't be. And that was being transported mm -hmm. through the breast milk into me. 
Um, and that's a common sort of uh, situation. So if I wasn't getting the, the sort of the, I guess the complete benefit from the breast milk, and if I was being exposed to some sort of allergen, maybe, then I would have never have really developed a healthy immune tolerance. And that is why I have issues with certain things like dairy, for example, to this day. Um, essentially, I have probably a low level allergy to it. Um, so there are a few things that goes on. And that's why I think it's really important to understand when does someone's health journey begin? Because if mm. you're like me and really almost from day one, you weren't thriving in health, you don't really have a baseline to get back to. You don't know what's possible in regards to your healing. Um, I'm pretty positive about these things. And I always like to think that, you know, you can get to a vibrant state of health, but that time period is going to be partly dependent on how healthy have you been in your past and what is your baseline? Um, you know, what were the first few years of your life like? Mm, yeah, for sure. And as you say, it can start, particularly with eczema, it can start from baby, really. Yeah, it? yeah. Um, and so, and uh, you talk a lot um, and you cover, and I think you have a course on this, in fact, which looks um, absolutely brilliant on resilience. So, mm. and, I, and I find this is something I use a lot in my own executive coaching um, in terms of making the body stronger. So not just managing stress, but also making ourselves physically and mentally stronger through deliberately stressing the body in some ways to improve it. And you've mentioned that you're doing more and more training in things like breath work, but it's interesting the way that you um, break things down um, in terms of you sort of separate them out into physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. Um, and, and a lot of people won't yet understand the distinction, I guess, between spiritual and emotional, because they can be quite closely interrelated. Um, can we just start, I suppose, with physical? Because I think that kind of leads in quite nicely from what we were talking about, because gut health is a component of that, isn't it? Mm. Um, how would you define for sort of physical resilience? Yeah, I think um, with resiliency, there are an awful lot of different definitions out there. And I mean, the simplest way to think about it is physical resilience is around our ability to bounce back from an adverse event. So we've experienced some type of stressor and how resilient we are will influence our ability to bounce back from that. Um, and that in the way that I sort of break it down from a physical, spiritual, emotional, mental perspective, we're obviously talking purely about the physical side of things to what level we can. So these are all interconnected. So we can't isolate one from the other ultimately. But when we're breaking it down into these definitions, we're therefore talking about maybe things like cortisol levels, blood pressure levels, blood glucose levels. Um, there is the concept of allostasis, which is per it partners the concept of physical resilience. And allostasis is, I describe to my clients, the partner in crime with homeostasis. So most people are very familiar with the concept of homeostasis, the idea we have a set point that we're trying to maintain. Allostasis is kind of dynamic homeostasis. So allostasis is the idea that we have to adapt, we have to change our physiology based on the environment and our circumstances to maintain homeostasis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but really simply, you go into a stressful experience and blood glucose, blood pressure, cortisol, adrenaline levels go up. You leave that stressful experience. And if you are resilient, um, those levels will come back down to their pre-event state. And that is kind of a, an allostatic response, basically, to maintain homeostasis. Then we have allostatic lows, which is the idea that every time we are using that allostatic mechanism so every time we're adapting to stress there is a little bit of wear and tear that accumulates within our physiology and some researchers use the term allostatic overloads and i use that for the idea that once there has been almost too much allostatic mechanism kicking in we end up with allostatic overloads which is really when the stress system has been overwhelmed and we no longer return to that initial set point, our physiology may have actually recalibrated itself to an entirely new set point. We've lost the original homeostasis. And that allostatic load or allostatic overload is really when we're going to be symptomatic and potentially 
pick up some form of diagnosis. And what's really interesting is you can look in PubMed and you can search around the research and you'll find papers talking about resiliency from a microbiome perspective, from an immune perspective, from a thyroid perspective. There are pe uh, papers talking about um, resilience with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, migraines. It's kind of this really growing area of research. And I think it's such an important concept because ultimately what we're always doing to some degree with every single client is we're looking to either build or kind of cultivate resiliency, even if that's in context of bringing someone back to their original set point when they were healthy. So that's kind of, I guess, the overarching concepts of physical resilience um, and this idea so of wear be, and tear. Would it be fair then to say that when you're talking about that, so the allostatic load um, mm. would be similar to, let's say, your... I don't know, I've got a walk bike behind me. So you're training on a walk bike really, really hard. Heart rate's going up and up and up. The body's adapting and you're doing some really heavy training. After that, for some people, they just won't recover if they're not in a good state as quickly. Whereas for an athlete, for example, they will do that work and then their heart rate will come back down to a very low level pretty quickly. And that's because they are physically more resilient. Um, but if you have, if the allostatic load goes too high then the body's baseline may just be sort of impaired if you like right so their resting mm. heart rate is now higher their blood pressure is higher and so the body returns to kind of this level rather than coming back to where it should be yeah exactly and you know the things that will influence that are the frequency of the stressor the mm -hmm. severity of the stressor um, probably being the two main primary ones. So, you know, if you're getting on that walk bike, but then you're giving yourself 48 hours rest before you do it again, you've probably given the body enough time to recuperate, rejuvenate um, before you go again. The problem, obviously, for many of us is we're having micro stresses throughout the day. Um, and therefore, that accumulation of stress is just happening relentlessly for many of us. Mm. One thing that I want to kind of or try and front load this conversation with is one of the problems with resiliency is I think when people are trying to use it as a way to just do more and more and more without mm. appreciating that that is a futile exercise. So resiliency is not about kind of being able to grit your te teeth and kind of get on with it and bounce back from stresses necessarily We've got to think about it slightly more holistically. And there's a paper that talks about, um, I, I think it's controlled stress and uncontrollable stress. And the paper was talking about nurses in a medical setting, I think. And the kind of general concept was, look, there are certain things you can't control and there are certain things you can control. And we really want resiliency for the things that we can't control. We don't want to be using the concept of resiliency to try and push ourselves so far that we're going to essentially end up burning out, but just by doing more. And I think that's the risk that certain personalities can fall into where they're seeking to just do more, 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 and they're flirting with kind of that allostatic loads anyway. So we that's need certainly what happened to me yeah, as a kind of type A personality and a corporate lawyer is more like, well, I can take on. And I think some people I found because they don't have the same perception of stress, then they don't set because what you're really talking about there almost is on the things you can control, set boundaries because mm. and you don't end up setting the boundaries because you don't feel the anxiety or the stress quite as much as, say, another person. And so then it just builds up and up and up until you're vulnerable to things like burnout or angst or depression. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that kind of almost brings in uh, a, well, I, I guess a bit of a mental, emotional and spiritual concept of resiliency. There's an amazing book called Resilient by Rick Hampson. And he talks a lot about sort of self-awareness as being a almost foundational element of resilience. Because if you're not aware of what's going on internally or externally, for that matter, um, you don't know where you're at ultimately in regards to kind of your your health, your allostatic loads and what some papers call your resiliency zone. The idea of going back to what you mentioned, we want to try and stay within this zone that allows us to maintain that flexibility in our physiology because resilience is not rigidity. Resilience is flexibility in everything. It's being able to adapt to the needs that are being placed upon us. 
Um, and for me, that's a huge one from a mental resiliency perspective when we're thinking about kind of cognitive well-being and our beliefs and our inner dialogue. If we are really stuck in our thoughts and in our process, and if we need things to be a certain way to, to get stuff done or whatever it may be, we're not actually very resilient, even though we might be being productive. Because what happens when the environment changes and you can't have all of those things in place that you say you need to be productive or to be the person you want to be? So a, a big part of it for me when we're talking about being resilient is being able to adapt to your environment and therefore you need flexibility. So we talked about allostasis being a key principle of physical resilience, being able to adapt physiologically to the demands of your day. We need to be able to mentally, emotionally and spiritually adapt to some degree as well. Obviously, with while also staying true to our higher self and our values and our purpose and our meaning in life. So it's kind of juggling this I guess, balance between being flexible in these processes while having the framework of what is important to you, which should be driving all of those sort of behaviours in the first place. So in terms of, um, it's really interesting the way you summarise that. So in terms of mental, when we're looking specifically now at mental resilience, yeah, someone, lots of people will be familiar with, they get triggered, for example, by a situation. Now, then we know it's gone too far, right? If someone cuts you up on the road and you are immediately triggered by that event, probably your stress level is now baseline is way, mm. way too high because, you know, ordinarily, if you've got that resilience and that flexibility that you're talking about, you'd have a very different approach to it. So you'd be like, it's annoying, but maybe that person's having a bad day or maybe they were in a rush. Um, how can people kind of, I guess, the, I've got two questions really. The first is how can we build mental resilience and flexibility as part of that? And how can we understand when before we get to that point that actually maybe now we're losing it and we're just loading too high yeah very good questions and i guess um to answer the second one first the second question first that comes back to how do we ultimately measure resiliency and one of the ways we can do that is subjectively and objectively. Well, two of the ways we can do that. So subjectively, there are validated questionnaires that we can use that analyze someone's resiliency. And that will, they often ask questions around um, things like self-agency and autonomy. So how much control do you feel you have over your life, for example? They may ask questions around your relationships and your interaction within your community, because as we all know, that is hardwired into our DNA. We cannot be a resilient person if we are someone who can't ask for help. So again, what are our sort of cultured beliefs around resiliency? Because it's really weird. I think sometimes we think someone is resilient when they're the person who gets stuff done and then they're able to do it themselves and they're not asking for help. Again, I would argue that's not a resilient person because there's no flexibility in that. Resiliency requires vulnerability in being able to ask for help and honoring that sort of process. So there's the subjectivity, and that's questionnaires. The objectivity is heart rate variability monitoring. Mm -hmm. So there are apps like HRV Elite. There is obviously the Aura Ring, and there are other apps available as well that will give you your heart rate variability score. And that is giving you an indication of the state of your autonomic nervous system ultimately. So what's going on within sort of the parasympathetic, sympathetic nervous system. And put really simply, because I'm not an expert on this, but a lot of the apps, um, I think I'm right in saying the Aura Ring doesn't do this. A lot of the apps that I've used in the past will give you a score from zero to 10, basically. And put very simply, the higher the score, the more parasympathetic and healthy that vagal tone is. The lower the score, the more sympathetic um, that your nervous system is. And with heart rate variability, what we're talking about is basically the variability in time in between each heartbeat. So the heart is not a metronome. It is not beating on the second uh, every second for 60 seconds if you have a heart rate of 60 beats a minute. It will beat, again, put very simply, twice in one second and not for a second. There is variability within the time between each heart beat. And that is ultimately what we're looking for. So we want a, a good variability in that HRV. And if we have that, that is indicative of someone who is in a state of 
resiliency ultimately they're not in a state of allostatic load or with high wear and tear so athletes or people who are overtraining um execs who are working too many hours and also putting in their exercise etc they may drop down to let's just say a four or five on this kind of scale telling them that they're entering a really kind of stressed state and again simply um putting this if they stay there for maybe two three consecutive days that is their body telling them they need to back off a little bit and they may want to go into more of a restorative yoga class do a breath work session have a couple of days off etc and just change that daily routine and honor the fact that they've kind of hit that point of overreaching and they now need to recoup before they can essentially go again otherwise they're risking burnout ultimately um, and then you have it at the other end of the spectrum. So for a while, I did a lot of HRV tracking with clients, but with my client population, which is largely those who are quite unwell, uh, a lot of those clients were scoring like nines, 9.2s, 9.3s all the time, every day. And, and sometimes, and I experienced this once myself, when these individuals were having a particularly stressful week, they were actually going more parasympathetic. They were hitting like tens. Um, one person even hit a 12, which I don't think theoretically was possible because it's a scale of zero to 10. That is what I understand as sympathetic withdrawal. This is someone who is asking their body to put the foot on the, the gas pedal while simultaneously their body is saying, oh my God, no, we cannot handle this and putting the other foot on the brake pedal at the same time because they don't have the resources they don't have the resiliency to deal with additional stress because their mind, body, spirit is already overwhelmed with a high allostatic load, basically. Mm, interesting. So HRV is a great way of tracking this from an objective perspective. And it's very easy to do with sort of, sort of apps first thing in the morning to get a gauge of what's going on. That, that scale that you were describing there, there are different ways of measuring it, aren't they? Because that one's looking between one and 10, whereas um, with Aura, for example, it's using a different mechanism that measures more in sort of 10 blocks of 10 and up. Um, so it depends yeah. over the time period it's taken, doesn't it? It does. And it gets really, really complicated. <laughs> yeah, it um, and it's something I've never properly dived into, but there are different ways, there are different algorithms and different things that can be evaluated. And then some of the better apps apparently will take some of the anomaly results out mm. of that time period they're tracking, which will make it slightly more accurate. And I think the Aura Ring does do that. I think it does um, for the most part. It's interesting because yeah. yesterday actually I was recording a podcast with Dr. Jay Wiles, who is an expert in HRV. Oh, and we cool. were talking and that was fascinating. I'm actually doing some training with him at the moment. And it was really interesting to hear that with athletes, often you'll see that they've got really high heart rate variability in part because they're so fit. Mm. But what he was describing is you can have people that have HRV of even 120, 130. Obviously, this is measured on the other scale. And yet they can't modulate it. So when he gets them to actively modulate it and he uses a lot of the Buteco breathing yes. that um, Patrick McEwen, who I've also had on, uses, and I think you know as well, um, and they can't modulate it at all. So they can move it by one. And so he's actually sure. saying, you know, don't compare, like, and you, I'm sure you'll say the same, never compare your HRV with someone else, compare it right. with your own, and then look at your ability to actually modulate that response. And then if that's falling, if it goes 20%, you, below where you normally are over the last 14 days and it looks like you're running into trouble um, and if it's 40 percent 100 percent, you've got to dial it back so that you get back to where you should be brilliant um, but it's a great technique isn't it because you can measure as you say objectively yeah it is it's really helpful and it's so interesting to see some of the things that can influence it you know coming from a slightly more holistic functional perspective obviously food for example will influence it so you can get an idea of how your body is responding to certain foods or meals um i was listening to a webinar with um patrick and a doctor from the us and his name escapes me but they were talking about the oxygen advantage method within the context of hrv so i think what you were saying there kind of really resonates it may, may even have been Dr. J, I wonder, because they I know they do a lot um, together, so it may Dr. have been. Dr. J. Is he, yeah. Does he do some work with Ben Greenfield? Yes, he does, that, yeah. Okay, yeah, hosts. that's him. Yes. Then, yeah. yeah, yeah, so really interesting. So that's, so that's on the kind of, um, we've looked at the physical and the mental there. I guess that you can't separate them, as you say, can you? Mm. Because when we're looking then at emotional, if you are emotionally kind of shot, then your HRV is likely to be very flat anyway, isn't yeah. it? And your heart's going to start to be more like a metronome. But I know you look at other things as well in terms of assessing 
emotional resilience. Can you kind of elaborate a bit more there? Yeah, so um, I think emotional resilience, one of the definitions I like is ultimately around being able to maintain a, a positive emotional state during adverse events. So again, it's kind of having that ability to self-regulate your emotions during challenging times. Um, and the main body of research that I have kind of been using at the moment is actually just from the HeartMath Institute. Um, so this idea that we can cultivate positive emotional states consciously, things like gratitude, joy, love, connection. And we know that that has an impact on our HRV, on our immune system, on the stress system, et cetera. So I think, you know, I keep it quite simple from that perspective at the moment while I kind of dive a little bit deeper into that research. And for me, it is ultimately about learning tools that allow us to self-regulate. And that's kind of a lot of the work by HeartMath is around that. So they have specific exercises that you can do um, almost like a meditation practice. So maybe in the morning it forms part of your morning routine, but they also have exercises that you can do in the moment during stress to help kind of snap you out of maybe a, a reactive sort of approach to the stress or challenge that you're facing. Um, so I use a lot of the heart math stuff and obviously they have their own biofeedback devices as well. So they have this term called um, psycho physiological coherence, I think it is, um, and coherence being a coherent connection between your emotional centers um, and your nervous system, I guess, ultimately. So their biofeedback devices, um, the one I have, uses almost like a traffic light system to give you an indication of how coherent you are. So you can do some breath work during it and it will give you a visual display of how coherent you are. And it's a beautiful biofeedback device that again uses HRV in a, not necessarily a different way, but they use different language is the way Dr. J describes it. So they talk about coherence and it is a really powerful tool when on the topic of emotions, basically. Mm. Um, so it really comes down to self-regulation and there are specific exercises that HeartMath use there. Um, and ultimately, a lot of that comes back to self-awareness and mindfulness. So the book I mentioned earlier, Rick Hansen's book, Resilient, that lays the foundation for being a resilient individual. Because again, if you're not aware of what's going on with your emotional life, you can't self-regulate yourself. So it all starts from an underlying awareness of what's going on. And as again, you'll know, and all your listeners, I'm sure, will know when we're talking about mindfulness, one of the benefits is it's giving us that little opportunity to to be present and not immediately react to the circumstance that's presented itself it's giving us that split second to just hit pause evaluate and decide how do i want to respond to this situation um and that is really the way into being able to self-regulate our emotional well-being and become someone who is emotionally resilient but like you say you can't separate that from the physical side of things you know if you've got some sort of physical dis-ease or imbalance that is creating a chronically activated stress response for example it's going to be very hard to then try and navigate that through trying to improve your emotional resilience until you've dealt with the physical side so i have experienced some um, within the context of things very low level anxiety episodes. I had a period of maybe a couple of months a few years ago and there were two noticeable periods of anxiety. And one, I was just in my car with my um, girlfriend at the time, wife now, we were driving home to see my parents. Life was good, but I had this really strong anxiety that I could, gen I could literally feel brew up from my stomach towards my chest. And on a separate occasion, I was going into a, a clinic I worked at in London. I was on the train and I, I almost had to get off the train because the anxiety was so bad, but I kind of breathed my way through it and it, it went away. And I was having some low level digestive symptoms at the time. I ran a stool test. There was a bacterial infection there, did the usual things we would do to modify the microbiome. And I haven't had any anxiety since. So trying to do that through an emotional perspective wouldn't have been the right route. There was a physical cause to that emotional sort of response or cognitive emotional response. Mm, interesting. So a, a challenging thing I find as a clinician these days is asking the question and trying to figure out with the client, you know, is this a physical, emotional, spiritual or mental um, root cause kind of thing? You know, what's the biggest fish in the pond that we need to be thinking about? 
um, or do we just want to be touching on all of them? Yeah, that is very, very interesting. It's, it's a bit like with, um, I know Patrick McEwen was saying how you can, at the end of the day, all the CBT in the world, you can look at the mental aspect, is never going to work if your breathing isn't right. Because if mm. you're shallow upper chest breathing, that's already physiologically communicating to the body that you're in a stress state. state. So even if you're trying to then analyze those thoughts and think about whether they're kind of ants, you know, automatic negative thoughts or whether they're really true and things like that. If you're breathing like this and your shoulders are all up here, physiologically, it's very difficult. And the mind follows the body and the body follows the mind, doesn't it? So it's so connected. Yeah. Um, interesting what you were saying there, because I want to come back to gut health when we kind of, if, if we just finish the last piece, because then there's yeah. the spiritual side, right? And I guess some people misunderstand this, right? So I, I very much see religion is a doctrine. So you're following a specific path. It's kind of a community of people who have the same belief in what spirituality forms, but spirituality exists on its own as well. So we're all spiritual, well, we're all human beings, right? Having, we're spiritual beings, should I say, having a human experience here. Mm. Um, and this is where we can get into things like creativity and flow state and, and accessing our kind of higher self. Um, can you explain obviously more about how you see it and how you can become spiritually resilient? Yeah, so I see spiritual resilience uh, being around understanding your values, understanding your needs, and having a purpose in life from a broad perspective. So to be spiritually resilient, you need to actually understand what your values are. And therefore, you know, having a session with a coach or just getting yourself a cup of coffee in the morning and sitting down and and figuring out what is important to you in life, I think is a really powerful exercise if we're trying to cultivate spiritual resilience because that becomes your North Star. That becomes the compass of life that allows you to know that you're staying on the right path. Um, if you don't know what your values are, if you don't know what's important to you, then you're kind of stumbling through life. Um, and it's a tricky one because if when we do kind of touch on and dabble with the psychedelic side of things, this sort of deeply resonates with me, which is... It's not easy sometimes. I think it can almost make life harder to begin with if you are going down the sort of the spiritual path because life and the world as it is now makes it very hard to, to navigate this easily because we are drawn into a sort of society and a culture which is so go, 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 so kind of materialistic with so much sort of stimuli being thrown at us on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a lot of distraction and noise that we have to try and filter out basically. So knowing your values at least helps with that. It gives you a path forward and therefore it gives you an idea of when you're veering off path because let's say every six months you can come back to your values, you can do a little bit of a life evaluation and figure out, okay, am I still on path? Have my values changed? Do I need to actually re-navigate this as well? Um, so that for me is sort of partly around spiritual resilience. And then obviously, you know, purpose falls within this as well. Meaning is a huge one. So there's a lot of research looking at those at the end stages of life, for example, asking them questions and things like this. And there was a beautiful paper, and I'm going to butcher this a little bit, unfortunately. But um, they basically were talking about the importance of being whole, spiritually speaking rather than necessarily biologically and what they basically were saying is you can have a dis-ease you can have a biological physical biochemical imbalance a diagnosis etc but you can still be whole as a person you can still have that kind of level of kind of love and meaning in life and that comes from creativity was the conclusion of the paper so whether that is music or some form of other art, whether it's sculpting, drawing, painting, singing, something around creativity in the arts, the research is quite clear, is really powerful as a way to cultivate health, to cultivate spiritual resilience. Um, and it modulates all sorts of things physically. You know, it modulates the immune system. It can reduce allostatic load, et cetera. So creativity is a huge part, I think, of spiritual resilience, which then, as we've mentioned a few times, interconnects with physical resilience and everything else as well. Um, and service, I guess, would have to put under spiritual resilience. Mm -hmm. So giving back, serving people, serving the world, thinking about the planet and how we can sort of improve things from that perspective. 
um, is a key part of it as well. And then you've got kind of, I guess, the caveat and the argument that to be able to do that to the fullest requires, to some degree, putting yourself first, I think, especially in the modern world. You know, we've got to have our own bucket full of our resources. Otherwise, again, it's just going to become another burden that is another hole in the bucket, meaning that we're not actually as resilient as we could be. So I think this is something that in the healthcare sector, a lot of um, practitioners can struggle with because we're, we're givers, we're carers, we want to help people. And I think a lot of us struggle sometimes with our own self-care because we're giving so much and there are always lessons to be learned in that. So looking back at, and using myself as an example to finish with this around meaning, I would not be where I am today if it wasn't for my eczema as a baby, my accident in the toilet at school without my IBS diagnosis, without all of those injuries, I would not be who I am today. I would not be where I am today. So it's kind of flipping that on its head almost. And rather than thinking about the what ifs and who I could have been if my childhood or my teenage years were a little bit easier, it's actually saying, well, all of those challenges have made me a more resilient person. And they've taken me down some absolutely incredible paths that quite frankly, I probably wouldn't have gone down, especially when I look at my network and my friends and where they are today. You know, they're all great, very healthy, wise people, but they're pretty much all in the corporate world. A lot of them don't really like their job, um, but it kind of gives them purpose in other ways in regards to play and holidays and things like this. So meaning can come from all of that adversity as well, ultimately. And that very much changes our relationship with suffering. Mm, very much so yeah I agree with that I, I certainly found that from my own experience and when I got really sick and ended up kind of in, you know hospitalized ultimately um sort of fighting my life actually I'm eternally grateful for that experience because it's actually made me you know where well, I left law and it, it's made me who I am today but it also mm. allowed me to access a part of me that maybe I was ignoring before and I'd, I'd kind of put the spiritual side to one side. And I think that's because initially, like I was saying between like religion and spirituality, I was raised under very strict Catholic upbringing. And so I kind of couldn't separate. And so all I wanted to do was move away from that. But then as soon as you disassociate spiritually, what happens is, is you're no, and I didn't completely, I still had some form of spirituality, but it wasn't as much as it is now. And I think when you disassociate in that way, you become what Joe Dispenza would call, you become more physical matter and less wave, right? So your energy is very disrupted at that point. And that had mental and physical problems um, for me. Whereas the experience that I had then allowed me to tap back into that concept of spirituality. And like you, it's an area I'm exploring more and more now um, to, to access really that state. Mm. Um, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, and it's beautiful. I think um, it's a challenging path to go down, I think, is my experience, but it's a beautiful path to go down. And it's one that we need to all, I think, explore to some degree to, to kind of, you know, shift the global stage, so to speak. Mm. Well, when you look at like the generations that are coming through as well, I think it's Daniel Pink that's kind of researched and written quite a few books, some are in the context of sales, but looking at the generation that's coming up now, they seem to be less motivated as we were. They're not, they're not happy. They have be sort of stronger boundaries, should I say. So they're not willing to sacrifice everything and just work because you're on a gravy train, like, mm. right, like I was. Oh, eventually, if you get to this, then you're a senior lawyer, then you're a partner, and then they're not willing to put up with that. And they have this concept of higher purpose that you were mentioning there. So they're motivated by um, bigger things, by contribution, by what happens in society. And I think that's an important shift. And I hope that the disruption that we're going through at the moment with everything with the pandemic, that hopefully good will come from that and that people will hopefully connect in a stronger way post COVID. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. It's needed. I think, you know, that connection is is so fundamental to resiliency uh, we said off air around you know the the value of kind of sitting circles sharing circles sacred spaces whether that's through psychedelics or breath work or any other modality yoga etc it's it's the most healing space i think that we can kind of enter ultimately and part of that is just the the deep connection that takes place in those sorts of settings I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Alex. If you want to find out more about Alex, then you can go to his website, alexmanos.co.uk, or you can find him on Instagram at alexandermanos.com 
or even Facebook at Alexander Manus Health and Performance. As I mentioned, we'll be releasing part two on Friday, where we take a deeper dive into the spiritual world, um, including more on breathwork, meditation, and also on Alex's own psychedelic experience. So tune in on Friday. It's a very special episode where I'll be releasing that content. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you did, please do like and review the podcast. It just helps me to get the message out to a wider audience. And as always, please send me messages on Instagram at Angela S. Foster or tag me as you're listening. I love all of that and engaging with you guys and just hearing your thoughts on the episodes and any feedback that you have. Feedback to me on Instagram and let me know perhaps more content or people you'd like me to interview or even solo episodes on certain pieces of content that you'd like me to record myself. I love connecting with you and thank you again so much for listening and supporting me and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for listening. Remember to review and subscribe. You can grab the show notes, the resources and highlights of everything Angela mentioned over at AngelaFosterPerformance.com. You can also snatch up plenty of other goodies, including the highly helpful Angela Recommends page, which is a list of everything she personally recommends to optimize your mind, body and lifestyle.